<laughs> so, you, you, so you were talking about ilm al-kalam, right? Yeah, look, yeah. Of course, I, one, you always, uh, sometimes you get caught in the crossfire and Twitter between two sides is, and you don't know which one's right and which one's wrong. Mm. I always see, you know, Salafis, you know, they're refuting the, the Ashari's and the Maturidis and they're always saying it's like a bid'ah, it's like an innovation. Um, could you explain to us how that came about? Uh, how that came about? Uh, because, of course, I don't know the time that... Um, you know, I feel like there had to be a revival of, 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 of creed because, you know, we've, the Akita was getting more diluted as the time went by. Um, but could you kind of elaborate on the Salafi perspective of, 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 of how, why they see it as an innovation? So it's quite a contentious uh, subject. But, well, it's, yeah. it's not a new one. No. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's been there for about a thousand years. Yeah. So, there's, you know, it's not like um, we're coming out with something new here. Uh, and to be honest, they have a point. Like, it's fine, you know, like, um, al kalam as a science yeah. wasn't taught by the Prophet, so, so, so. you know, so from, from that perspective, yeah, you, you know, you're right. But there's also other things that weren't done by the Prophet, so, 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 but as and when, as and when there was a need, the Muslims adopted it. For example, if you look at tactics of warfare, yeah. you know, the Prophet so, so, didn't use a gun, didn't have guns. But as and when that was needed, they, they used guns. You know, the Prophet didn't set up a formal madrasa. Yeah. You had the Sahab of Sufa, the back of Masjid Nabawi. But you didn't have like a formal madrasa with a curriculum. You come in, you study grammar first, and then you study you know the, the tools of learning, and then you move on. So like the the Prophet never told us to write books of fiqh, and then order them with you know kitab al tahara, you know purification, <coughs> prayer, fasting. So like the Prophet taught you. But he didn't tell you necessarily how you need to go and teach everybody else. Mm. You know, you can you could be innovative. You know, to use the word innovation here, which is hasana, yeah. which is good. You know, because you have good you have good innovations about innovations. <laughs> That's just a fact. You know, the mushaf. I mean, the Arab and the mushaf. The fatah damma kasra wasn't there. That's a bid'ah, but it was a bid'ah that was needed because there were ajam non-Arabs that couldn't read Arabic. Yeah. So it was to help them. <laughs> Etc. 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 I mean, it's common sense to realize that sometimes these things are needed. So they're right in the sense that the Prophet didn't teach the science of Ilm al Kalam in that sense. However, he did teach creed. The Quran is full of creed. It's full of aqaid. And then there were certain periods within our history, very early on, like early, early on. To be honest, even in the time of the Sahaba, where there were certain theological questions that were posed, questions regarding uh, divine. Uh, decree, for example, or the idea of uh, sin and its relationship to kufr, that is a major sin, disbelief. These sort of things began to surface and people began to discuss them as theological issues. And as Islam spread and it spread in the diaspora, Muslims spread into places that, let's say, were more philosophically inclined, they naturally started to ask more philosophical questions. And hence in Baghdad, for example, you see, I mean, like I said, there were a whole host of theological schools before this, by the way. Mm. I'm fast forwarding. Mm. You have schools like the Ma'atazila that come out, very rationalist, that pose certain questions that actually reject certain religious texts mm. of the Quran because of their posing these theological questions. Mm. So the, the, the Ashari tradition, let's say of Abu Hassan Ashari and <coughs> Imam Maturidi, but let's say Abu Hassan Ashari for now for a second, mm. came out of a need to respond to those people in a language that they understood. That's all it was. It was how do I respond to you? For example, when you're studying Ashari Kalam, you're learning Allah uh, has the Sifa of Wahdaniyah. Is Wahid. Fi dhati wa af'ali wa sifati. Oh my God, what is this? Why are you talking in this language? Well, what are you saying? That Allah is one in His essence, one in His acts, and that nobody shares in His acts, one in His attributes, and nobody shares His attributes. Is that anything different to what's in the Quran? Now, how I'm going to explain that to you? Will vary depending on the student. Yeah. Somebody just will be like, yeah, cut that straight away. No yeah. problem. Mm. Somebody will be like, yeah, yeah, but I don't understand. What about this? What about yes. that? What about that? Yes. So the job of the scholar is not to sit there and be like, you know how sometimes they used to say that like, certain, uh, certain people that a young person comes into the masjid and he says, oh, Imam Sam, <coughs> you know, what about this Muslim? And he says, oh, astaghfirullah, ittaqillah, fair Allah, and uh, you, this uh, haram asking these questions and dafa will go away. And they're like, oh, these guys don't have answers. So when they don't have answers, you criticize them. When they give you answers, you criticize them. Like it's a bit of a catch-22. 
Yeah. So you have to be able to give answers in a language that is musallam, which is mutually uh, agreed upon. And that language is always going to be the aql. It's going to be rational. Everybody can agree on that. Everybody can agree that a square is not a circle. Everybody can agree that you can't have a square circle. One thing cannot be both a square and a circle. Everybody agrees with that. So when the today, let's now not take this to your question in particular on Twitter wars. When you're talking about somebody on Twitter, a Salafi saying, oh my God, these Ashadis are Ahlul Bid'ah, etc. SubhanAllah, it's shocking to me because they have, I don't know who this person is. If, if, if a Salafi well, yeah, is someone that, let's say, believes Ibn Taymiyyah to be a great Shaykh, and he says Ilmul Kalam is a Bid'ah, then he has not read Ibn Taymiyyah. Hmm. Like that's a, you know, Ilzami job. That's like a, that's just a, what we call in our language a Paki. Yeah, it's a Paki. <laughs> yeah? Because what, it, what that means is that it's like, it's, I mean, it's not really an answer. It's just kind of like a, aha, touche. Hmm. You haven't read Ibn Taymiyyah. Because Ibn Taymiyyah, if they read his Dar Ta'arud al Aql, uh, one Nakal, uh, they'd see that he is fully engaging in all of these climate discussions. You know. he, his issue was just with ta'wil of the Quran. That you shouldn't make ta'wil of certain things that God says about himself. And, and ta'wil, uh, just to explain, is uh, allegorical. Yeah, like reasoning. if Allah says yad, which in Arabic means hand, yeah. then you just say Allah has a hand and you move on. Yeah. Mm. Uh, whereas for the Asha'ira, they would say um, that yad. Well, yad only has one linguistic meaning, which is this. An appendage, yeah. This appendage. Yeah. And so you can't say that, that God meant yad linguistically here. Mm -hmm. So you have to negate the literal meaning. Mm -hmm. And it's a metaphor. And then you have two schools of thought. Mm -hmm. You have some of the asharis that basically said that yad means qudra. We're not saying for sure that it means qudra, but that's what's most likely what that means. And then you had, for example, the maturidis, the Hanafis, that would say that the uh, the it's definitely not the, 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 the literal meaning. It's definitely not the literal meaning. Um, but as for what it does with the metaphor, Wallahu alam. So they would do in the kar of Zahir, they would reject the outward meaning, the literal meaning, and they would do tafweed al ma'na. And what the meaning is they would do tafweed, which means that they would assign that to God. They would resign that to God and say, Allah knows best. Whereas some of the Asharis, they would say, no, no, the, the meaning is this. Obviously, we don't know 100% sure, but that is looking at the context. Like when Allah says, Yadullah fawqa idihim, God's hand is over their hands, meaning that when you all come together, then God's hand is over your hand. Meaning that when you work together, you'll see the power of God in that. Mm, subhanAllah. Yeah, that's what they would say. Yeah. So with, with regards to the Salafis is that they haven't. And that's why a lot of certain modern Salafis, particularly those in the Da'wah, when they're trying to deal with atheism, when they're trying to deal with other issues, you've noticed that they've all come into kalam now. Mm. All of them. They've all come into kalam. Um, and then they've even found, and when they've gone back in the side, because what happened is that what they did with Ibn Taymiyyah, apparently, I, I won't say it because I don't have a, a, a reference on it, but apparently there was some senior mashaykh of the Salafi da'wah, I'm talking classical Salafi da'wah, we're talking like, you know, 50 years ago. And I say classical Salafi da'wah, it's not like our classical tradition, which is like 700 years ago. Their classical tradition is like 50 years ago. Because obviously they, they've only been in existence for a little while. Uh, and uh, I don't say that in a ta'ab, but you know, at the same time, you know, uh, you know, I do mean it. But like, the, you know, the, but so, so what they're doing is that when they're going back, so some of these classical scholars, they w wouldn't read those books of Ibn Taymiyyah, they would say we don't understand them. So now when these guys, because they've got philosophical training, when they're reading Ibn Taymiyyah, they're like, oh, he's talking about jawahir and arad and atoms and accidents, and he's talking about, he's using all of these, these, these terminologies of the, of the philosopher and the hukama. And the... So the point is, is that I would, I would ignore these debates because they don't know what they're talking about. That, 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 that person on, 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 on Twitter doesn't know what he's talking about. And that's the problem, that when you're on that space, Everyone just has an opinion, mm -hmm. you know, and so knowledge becomes almost irrelevant now. Yeah, yeah it becomes irrelevant. Truth becomes irrelevant mm -hmm. because if I've got a million followers or a million, yeah, followers on Twitter, and I tweet something, and you look at my tweet and it's got one point two million followers on it, it's almost irrelevant what I just said because there must be some substance to what I said because I've got a million followers, mm -hmm. you know. So truth becomes irrelevant, you know. Huxley got it right. 
There will mm. be an overflow of truth, he said, in the future. Oh, That's what he said, al yeah. yeah. He said, there'll be an overflow, a brave new world. He said, there'll be an overflow of truth that people will flood you with so much, so much truth, information. There'll be so much information that truth will become irrelevant. Mm. Mm. That happened, yeah,